Hello everybody, hope you're doing well and thank you for joining us today. Recently I published a video which looked at some footage from the ISS overlooking Earth. And what made this footage particularly interesting was that it wasn't just a regular video, but was instead a time lapse made up of over 1300 individual photographs. And the website also had hundreds of other individual photographs of Earth from the ISS across various missions over the years. And all of them were available to download in high quality original RAW files. Now, they've captured photographs of all sorts of things from the ISS, even stuff in current news. Everything from wildfires to volcanoes, thunderstorms to war zones. And if you like thunder and war, then maybe check out War Thunder, who are sponsoring this video. Take to battle with any one of over 2,000 tanks, planes, helicopters and ships spanning the last 100 years of human conflict. All with incredibly high detailed modelling and damage systems for a truly immersive PvP combat experience for any and all play styles. I've been playing war games since I was a kid, but War Thunder is the first one I've experienced that incorporates so many branches of combat in one place, all able to interact with each other. For me, nothing quite beats the feeling of unleashing a full broadside from a battleship. Play War Thunder for free today on PC, Xbox Series X and S, PlayStation 5, as well as the previous generations of consoles. And if you sign up on a PC using my link in the description below, you'll receive a large free bonus pack, which includes multiple premium vehicles, premium account, as well as boosters to get you started. Now, before we get into all of this, I would just like to take a moment to clear something up about that previous video that I mentioned. In the original version I uploaded, I stated that raw files can't be manipulated or faked, and a few people did point out to me that that isn't accurate. After all, any digital file has the potential to be altered, and I have since clipped those parts of the video out, as obviously I don't want to be spreading false information. However, ultimately, that doesn't really detract from the point of the video, because I'd still argue that those images are undebunkable. After all, to actually debunk something requires actual relevant proof that the files have been altered, not just saying, well, they could hypothetically be, so therefore they are. Otherwise, you could argue that flat earthers don't really exist, they're just CGI or robots. I've examined those files up close and I can see absolutely no anomalies, errors or inconsistencies between any of the 1,338 separate images to suggest that they are faked in any way. And having the extra flexibility of them being raw files, with things like the amount of shadow recovery, etc., faking them properly is much harder than trying to fake normal JPEG images. Anyway, I was looking through some of these other image collections on the site that I mentioned, and some of them got me thinking. We've had examples of people like Scott Manley, Red's Rhetoric, and Astronomy Live who photographed the ISS on Earth and measured the shift in parallax between different vantage points to calculate the height of the ISS from Earth. But we could actually use some of those raw images taken from the ISS, along with some trigonometry, to calculate fairly accurately the altitude that the camera was at when those images were taken. For example, here is a photograph of the circuit Paul Ricard in southern France. Now, it's clear that this image was taken from pretty much perfectly overhead, and the camera's EXIF data tells us that this was shot with a Nikon D5 DSLR with a 1600mm focal length, which they've actually managed to get by using a Nikon 800mm f5.6 super telephoto lens fitted with what we call a 2 times teleconverter. This is something which fits onto the back of the lens, in between the lens and the camera body, and actually magnifies the image being projected from the lens. So a 2 times teleconverter would magnify an 800mm field of view down to a 1600mm field of view. I realise I've probably just confused a lot of non-photographers there, so let me just break this down. The focal length of a lens is essentially a measurement from the point of convergence inside the lens, which is where all of the light intersects and forms a point, a distance from there to the camera sensor. A shorter focal length gives a wider field of view, and a longer focal length gives a narrower field of view. Now, the physical focal length of a lens doesn't always correlate to a particular angle of view, 
because the size of the camera sensor can cause a change in how much of the image is visible and thus change what field of view we can see. However, we then have effective focal length, which is what focal length would you have to put onto a 35mm full frame camera in order to create that field of view that we are seeing i.e. if I were to mount a 50mm lens on my Sony a6400 which has a 1.5 times crop factor APS-C sensor then to get the same field of view on my 35mm full frame Sony a7 III I would have to put a lens on that has a focal length one and a half times longer than 50mm i.e. 75mm so the 50mm lens on the APS-C camera gives us an effective focal length of 75mm. And a 75mm effective focal length will produce the same field of view regardless of what sensor size we're dealing with. It produces a horizontal field of view of 27 degrees. Meaning essentially we are looking down an isosceles triangle that has a vertex angle of 27 degrees from the left edge to the right edge. And the further back that the camera moves from a particular location, the more distance across that baseline will become visible. Which means using a known field of view as a vertex angle, along with a known baseline distance, will allow us to work out the height from the apex. I.e. how high a camera with that particular field of view must be away from a subject in order to see that amount of baseline distance. So to test this, here I have a 75mm lens on a full frame camera, so this should be producing a 27 degrees horizontal field of view. I'm going to set up a tape measure against the wall, and then I'm going to place the camera one meter away. Now bearing in mind this is one meter from the point of convergence, which itself is about seven and a half centimeters from the camera sensor. So from tape measure to camera sensor, we're looking around 107 and a half centimeters. Now, based on that triangle with a height of 100 centimeters and a vertex angle of 27 degrees, our baseline should be 48 centimeters. Meaning if we were to place the camera so that the left edge of the frame aligns with the zero centimeters on the tape measure, 24 centimeters should be in the center and 48 centimeters should be on the right side edge. And we can use this same principle in reverse. Knowing the vertex angle and the baseline distance will allow us to calculate the height of the triangle. So using a field of view calculator, we can see that a 1600 millimeter focal length on a 35 mil full frame sensor like the Nikon D5 produces an image with a field of view of 1.29 degrees on the longest side and 0.859 degrees along the short side of the image. So that gives us a known angle of view for the lens. Now we need to work out how much of the Earth is that angle of view allowing us to see. For this, we'll take a look at Google Maps for Paul Ricard and the surrounding area. We can take a screenshot of that, bring it into Photoshop, and then overlay the raw image file from the ISS. And we can see that the long edge of the image runs from just above Le Castellet to this circular track at the top of the image. We can measure this on Google Earth and we get a distance of pretty much exactly 6 miles or 9.6 kilometers as the crow flies. So if we now plug in a vertex angle of 1.29 degrees because we're measuring our baseline based on the long edge of the image, our baseline distance is 6 miles which in turn produces a height of the triangle of 266.5 miles or 429 kilometers. Meaning that that is how high the camera would have to be with a field of view that narrow to see that much distance across the surface of Earth. Or let's take this image, ISS 023-E-50442, which was taken back in May 2010 directly above the city of London. This was taken with a Nikon D3S along with a 800mm focal length. So still a full frame camera, and that gives us a horizontal field of view of 2.58 degrees. And referencing it against Google Maps, we can see that the right side mid frame of the image is just by Bartlett Park, and the left side of the image is on the far side of Cheswick Bridge, just by the corner of the Mortlet Cemetery, which Google Maps has down as a distance of 11.25 miles as the crow flies. 
So once again, we take our isosceles triangle calculator. We have a baseline distance of 11.25 miles and a vertex angle of 2.58 degrees. And this gives us an apex height of 251 miles or 404 kilometers. Again, exactly in the region we would expect for the International Space Station. Now, something to bear in mind when trying to do this with other photos is that it really works best if the picture is taken looking pretty much exactly straight down because this gives us the most accurate figure for the height. If the photo is taken looking down on a slight angle, then you're left calculating the distance that the camera is away from the center of the image, not the ground below. Provided the angle of the camera isn't too much away from straight down, then you can still calculate the altitude, but you will have to take the GPS data of the image to see where the ground position of the ISS was, then use Google Earth to find out the distance from the ground position of the ISS to the ground position in the center of the photograph. That will then give you a baseline length. You then use a 90 degree angle for the opposite edge, and you have your hypotenuse length, which we've calculated based from the field of view. Now, this will only work with photos where the ground distances between the ISS to the center of the photograph aren't too far. Otherwise, you start to suffer increasing amounts of inaccuracy due to Earth curvature. In those instances, it would then require another level of calculations to work out a chord length through the Earth. That is going to wrap this video up. Once again, thank you to War Thunder for sponsoring this video. And don't forget to use the link below to claim that great sign-on bonus. If you've enjoyed this video and you haven't already done so, then please consider hitting the like and subscribe buttons. And hopefully, we'll see you in the next video.